Welcome to On Contact. Today we discuss strategies of resistance with community organizer Michael Geegan. Power is organized people and organized money. Uh, most activists stress organized people and forget organized money. As organizers, we stress both. On Contact. On Contact. Chris Hedges. College-educated elites, on behalf of corporations, carried out the savage neoliberal assault on the working poor. Now they are being made to pay. Their duplicity, embodied in politicians such as Bill and Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, succeeded for decades. These elites, many from East Coast Ivy League schools, spoke the language of values, civility, inclusivity, a condemnation of overt racism and bigotry, a concern for the middle class, while thrusting a knife into the back of the underclass for their corporate masters. This game has ended. There are tens of millions of Americans, especially lower class whites, rightfully enraged at what has been done to them, their families, and their communities. They have risen up to reject the neoliberal policies and political correctness imposed on them by college-educated elites. The Democrats foolishly anointed Hillary Clinton as their presidential candidate. She epitomized the double dealing of the college educated class, those who speak the feel your pain language of ordinary men and women who hold up the Bible of political correctness while selling out the poor and the working poor to corporate power. And unless there is a resurgence of left-wing populism, which will only occur outside the Democratic Party to defy the neoliberal order, we will cement into place an American fascism. RT correspondent Anya Parampel looks at the godfather of community organizing, Saul Alinsky. Conservative thought leader William F. Buckley once described him as, quote, very close to being an organizational genius. He's the founder of modern community organizing, none other than Saul Alinsky. Alinsky was born in Chicago and began his life's work organizing in the city during the Great Depression. In 1939, he founded the Back of the Yards Neighborhood Council, and the Alinsky School of Organizing was born. It's based on the simple concept that communities can directly advocate for improved living conditions by building coalitions outside of the government. According to its website, the Back of the Yards Neighborhood Council began as a, quote, collaboration of all the individual ethnic schools, churches, and various social clubs. The board of directors was elected by an annual community congress where all the groups were represented. The BYNC motto, we the people will work out our own destiny, reflects what it was created to accomplish. The organization exists to this day. The next year, he founded the Industrial Areas Foundation based on the same model. It's since expanded to include civic organizations, religious congregations, unions, and nonprofits across 65 cities in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, Germany, and Australia. In his 1946 book, Reveille for Radicals, Alinsky declared, quote, society has good reason to fear the radical. Every shaking advance of mankind toward equality and justice has come from the radical. He hits, he hurts, he is dangerous. Conservative interests know that while liberals are most adept at breaking their own necks with their tongues, radicals are most adept at breaking the necks of conservatives. Though his life was dedicated to political action, Alinsky himself rejected political parties and organizations, even refusing to join the very groups he created. Thank you, Anya. Michael Geegan is a community organizer with the Industrial Areas Foundation. He trained with Ed Chambers, the successor to Chicago organizer Saul Alinsky. He is the current co-director with Ernesto Cortez Jr. of the IAF, with more than 60 affiliates in the US, UK, Germany, Australia, and Canada. He is the author of Going Public, an organizer's guide to citizen action. Your book, Going Public, talks about how to build organizations to empower ordinary citizens. And it has many uh, elements to it that are counterintuitive. Uh, the first being that you don't organize around particular issues. We think the issues are, in a sense, the easy part. Mm. Um, when we go into a place like East Brooklyn or the South Bronx or the west side of Chicago, you can take a ride around the neighborhood and see many of the issues right up front. What you can't see is, is there a fabric of relationships among leaders and institutions in those areas? So we spend the first year or two or three building that, identifying leaders, identifying institutions that are actually uh, grounded in those communities, 
doing training with leaders, uh, raising money so that the organization uh, doesn't uh, run out of money right at the start. Well, you make that, you say that that's a priority, that these organizations, I think when you do Brooklyn congregations, right. which builds how many homes? 5,000 5, homes, right. finally, on right. their own initiative. Right. Uh, that the first thing you tell them is that they have to raise, I think, a quarter of a million dollars. That's These right. are poor communities. Right, right. in 1980. In 1980. A quarter right. of a million dollars is still a lot of money, but it was a, it was a lot more money in 1980. But and, why? Uh, because power is organized people and organized money. Uh, most activists stress organized people and forget organized money. As organizers, we stress both. We think people have to have control of their own money. Otherwise, they become dependent on government. Which you askew. You say don't take government well, money. That's correct. We don't take government money. Uh, we, we want independence. We want ownership. Uh, we want people to have skin in the game. Uh, we want people to be able to walk away from any situation they want to, to confront anyone they want to, without worrying about having their budget slashed or eliminated. So we stress both, organized people and organized money. It's essentially building the foundation of the organization first. And then, once that's fairly solid, then we begin to identify issues through a real deliberate process of house meetings, individual meetings, listening to people. And not just doing a poll of a community, you know, what do you, what do you care about or what are you concerned about, but, but asking people what they're concerned about and then asking them, are you willing to do something about it? And pushing, pushing the idea that they have to have some ownership. So when you build a community organization, what is the overarching theme if it's not built around an issue such as housing or safe streets power. or something? Yeah, well, that's a word you talk a lot about. The, in the, book. the overarching theme is power that in the third sector, in the civic, uh, civil, civic sector, you have to have power because everything you need and want vis-a-vis -vis the government or vis-a-vis -vis the corporate sector is going to involve power. And the decision making in those situations is not about merit or how nice you are or how deep the need is. It's about do you have enough power to compel a reaction from the state or a, a reaction from the corporate sector. So when people say, what are you, what are you building around? We say, we're building around power. And people who understand power tend to have the patience to, to, to build a base, do the training, raise the money, so that when they start to go into action, they surprise people. You know, uh, a, a journalist here in New York, when we started, uh, uh, wrote a wonderful piece. He said the, the, the political establishment wondered, where did these people come from? And uh, you know they hadn't seen the two and a half years of work that we'd done before that. You all, when you when you go and build these organizations, you write in the book, you don't look for the charismatic leader. There's there again, it's kind of counterintuitive the people who you want to build an organization upon. Right. What are the characteristics that you look for? Well, and I, I wrote a little bit about this. One is anger. Uh, but it's not hot anger, or it's not rhetorical anger, it's not the ability to give a great speech, it's the deep anger that comes from grief. People look at their community, or look at their children, or look at their schools, or look at their blocks, and they grieve, they, they feel the loss of that. And often those people are not the, the, the best speakers or the best known people in the community, but they're very deep, they have great relationships with other people, and they can build trust with other people because they're not self-promotional. They're, they're, they're about what's, what the issues are in their community. So we look for anger. We look for people who have, I call it the pilot light of leadership. It's always there. It's always burning. And then good leaders can turn it up and down depending on the, the circumstance. Uh, then we also look for humor. I mean, there has to be some joy in this and some fun and some irreverence. And some of our actions uh, are quite irreverent. And, and, Give me and, an example. Well, we, we had a meeting with the commissioner of parks many years ago, and he was a great liberal. And he thought- Well, it was, you don't like liberals too much. Not so much, <laughs> no, not, not very much at all. And he, was a, he considered himself a man of the people, and uh, uh, it was a park in, in Brownsville, and they'd been working on it for three years, and it was not even close to completion. So we, we put together a team of leaders led by Alice McCollum, a great leader. And we had one question. When will you complete the, the, the construction of Betsy Head Park and Pool? So when we went in, we met with his team. He starts out welcoming us, says, I love this, democracy in action, blah, blah, blah. So Alice asked the question. And then he tries to defer to his staff, and she asks it again. And he tries to defer again, and then she says, sir, in a low voice, when will you complete the construction of Betsy Head Park and Pool? And he starts to lose his temper. 
and he starts calling us, you people, yeah, yeah, it's in the book. you people, walk in here and yell and scream. She was whispering at that point. So he yelled as we walked out of the room and went to the elevator, but the reaction was very powerful. And he knew that uh, we wouldn't stop there. And, and the park and pool got rebuilt very quickly after that. Once it was rebuilt, we had an event and he was there and Alice McCollum went up to him and put out her hand to shake it and he recoiled at first, flinched, but then he put his hand out too and, and uh, said thank you for doing this. So Well power, and there's a scene in the book where you go to a dinner with former Mayor Ed Koch. Right. Power is the ability, and you, Ed, um, uh, the great Chambers, Chambers right. the great organizer right. he worked with and uh, who had worked with Alinsky, um, tells you, you know, the door swings both ways. The, right. You can go, and, uh, but you can't go out that door if you don't have power. You can't go out that door if you don't have power, and you can't go out that door. I mean, you walk out of the, because he insults you and your right. organization. You, right. you refuse to have dinner with him. Right. Uh, and uh, he, uh, uh, suddenly, he, he, he did insult us very badly. So I stood up. Oh, you communists and Nazis, basically. In the same, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then he said, let's have dinner. Right, right, right. So I, as the other people, um, uh, the Margolis and uh, the Marriott's and others went into the dining room, I pulled the mayor aside and said, I'm not eating with you. You called our people communists and Nazis, and you expect me to have dinner? And he, uh, he got very upset, and he said, you can't do this to me. And he grabbed me by my suit coat, and I, uh, and I said, Mr. Mayor, where's my coat? I'm leaving, it was winter. Uh, and he held on to me and finally I, I broke free. I said, you can keep my coat. And then he, he asked the staff to, to get the coat. By the way, the staff was, were, were, were lined up in all the, uh, all the uh, doorways and they were smiling as this happened because they'd seen this routine of his many other times. The reason I could walk out is because Ed Chambers, uh, my mentor in organizing, warned me that and, and alerted me the door swings both ways they don't control you in that setting and the other reason was i was connected to people who the mayor insulted and i wouldn't let those people down by sitting down after all that and then trying to talk it out over dinner so knowing who you're connected to or what team you're on is really a key thing in organizing and i think it's it's what many modern activists lose sight of. They have a theoretical sense of who they're with. And that's what we're going to talk right. after the break. Okay. Thanks. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation with community organizer Michael Geegan. On Contact. On Contact. Chris Hedges. Welcome back to On Contact. We continue our conversation with a community organizer and co-director of the Industrial Areas Foundation, Michael Geegan. So I want to talk about what activists today uh, have to do in this, in the devastation that has been writ large across our country. You end the book by talking about this. But before I do, I want to ask one more question, and that is uh, you refer in the book to people who organize being able to draw on the memory, the memory of communal groups, of communities, of, I mean, even mentioning you know, what it was like on their farm, maybe in Panama or something. Right, right. And there, are, there is a new generation that doesn't have that memory. How do you deal with that? It's a really good question. Uh, we had a young fellow in Chicago recently named Ian from uh, West Coast, uh, wealthy background, um, graduated from college, had a lot of money, toured the country, just looking for what to do next. Came to Chicago and ended up doing an internship with us. And he, he decided he had to just go to work like most people do, and he did. And then he started participating in local institutions. And he began to, to really rethink how he operated in the public arena. Uh, that it wasn't all about being with your best friends who all thought like you and affirmed everything you did. It was about being out in the mix of the world. And so he moved back to Oakland, joined a church, joined a soccer league, uh, got a full-time job, and is kind of rethinking his life through institutions. So I think part of the answer is people who do have some memory of healthy institutions have to kind of uh, coach young people and urge them to at least think about that. There's a little bit of idolatry about modern young Americans and- uh, Well, it's the cult of the self. Cult of the we self, just, you know, right. Elected a president who embodies it. 
that's right, and that we can invent everything right. from scratch, that we have nothing, we inherit nothing from our parents and grandparents. So part of it is just, you know, uh, t teaching people, urging people, agitating young people, hey. Um, but you, you draw a lot on your organizing from church congregations, yes. clearly. Yep. You did in Brooklyn. Yep. Still Chicago. Do. Yep. And, and yet those numbers are, are declining. Uh, true, and and as I always say, you have to organize who's in front of you, not who you who used to be in front of you. So in places like Chicago or Cleveland or Baltimore, the congregations that used to be very robust and, and strong are weaker, right? Thinner. So we are still organizing with them, but we're also looking at different institutions. Schools are institutions. Right. They're more complicated. Uh, but there are institutions in those neighborhoods, so we're, we're recruiting schools in many places. Sometimes it's housing groups. Uh, sometimes we build a new institution called East Brooklyn Congregations or United Power for Action and Justice that itself is an institution in that community. So we're, we're, we're recruiting the best of the existing. We're working with some of those existing to, to reconnect to people and expand. And then we're finding new institutions, but it has to be institutional in some way, although it's harder, clearly. So let's talk about the lessons you've learned as an organizer. Um, and as we go forward in a dysfunctional democracy where uh, reform is increasingly impossible given the governmental institutions that are in place, right. what you see when you look at groups like Occupy, or what, what kind of correctives would you suggest? Uh, well, the first is not to accept uh, defeat. Um, in 1980 in New York, the, all the liberal establishment, the entire establishment uh, was saying that New York would never be as strong as it once was. It, would, uh, it was called benign neglect. It's only benign if you're not being neglected. Uh, uh, and so they wrote off whole parts of New York permanently in, in their minds. And our organizations and our leaders simply didn't accept that judgment from the elites. Said, well, we're, you know, things are hard, they're tough, but we're going to build an organization. We're going to begin to identify things we can correct, and we're going to correct them. And we're going to correct them with government if we can or without it. We'll raise our own money, we'll figure out our own housing strategy, we'll hire our own developer and, and general manager. So it's being more flexible and plastic about solutions. It's not just relying on what the state or what the market says is possible. It's creating your own kind of options there. And then I think it is investing in institutions. I don't think, I don't see any other way around it. If, if you can't- Established institutions. And new ones. If you can't create, if you can't engage institutions or create new and better ones, whether they be churches or civic or union, I don't think it's possible. I think individually, one by one, uh, the power in the other two sectors dominates. And that's been, that's been the case. As you see in the UK, there was an excellent article in London Review of Books about how in the UK the public sector is being reduced year by year. The Which council is true here too. Uh, let, yeah, true here, a little a little slower, but it's it's happening. Well, they've destroyed here. their post office. We haven't done that yet. Well, we've destroyed our libraries. Yeah. So in Trenton, they closed the four neighborhood libraries right near near right. In, in southern New Jersey. Now th those are public spaces right. where people who need to learn things about, let's say, immigration rights. That's where they go. And if, but if there's no public space, if there's no public sector, um, it, it, you know, it's, it's very dangerous. So I'd say if you wanted to do something in Trenton, you should think about reinstating those four local libraries and tell the Princeton University people who spent $300 million on a, on a, on a useless arts neighborhood right. to invest it there. So There you go. And the donator, the guy who donated the money, Peter Lewis, didn't even want a building. Oh, um, sure, right. yeah. oh. You talk in the book about what you call the four habits right. for successful organizing, which I want to go through. The first one being relating. Right. Knowing how to build a public relationship. Uh, it's an art. And it is. And I was telling you before, very similar in terms of being a good journalist. Correct. Building relationships. Correct. Correct. You quote Senate about the, you know, that we live in a culture, the tyranny of intimacy, Oprah and the feel your pain, which of course is faux intimacy. Right. The Absolutely. language of intimacy without being intimate. Right. Talk about what that means, relating. Well, uh, uh, take it in the, in the context of our current situation. How do you build relationships with people who voted for Trump? Right. 
uh, you don't do it by email or, or on the internet. You go and sit down with them and meet them. And so one of our organizers from Chicago went down to Southern Illinois, where many of her relatives uh, voted for Trump, and spent the weekend there kind of reconnecting and just listening to right. them. Why did you do it? What was in your mind? What did you think? So the, the first, the first uh, obligation, and, and Bonhoeffer said this, is the, is the ministry of listening. Yeah. We have to listen to people unlike ourselves. And, and, agit and once we build a relationship, then agitate them and be willing to be agitated by them. So the habit of relating to people who don't agree with you on everything is a habit that we emphasize, and that's a lost art in, in, in modern society. And action. The habit of action. Habit of action, yeah. It's, and it's not at reenactment, as I describe it. It's not repeating an action from the, from the 60s, which is where I started in life and which I revere. But the establishment's figured out how to resist those actions. Go into a pro. <laughs> right, right, and deflect them. Yeah. And have successfully. fake arrests. Right, right. So everybody looks like they've had an action. No, they haven't. Right. They've had a reenactment. Boutique activism. That's I've right. done it a few times. Oh, you yeah. have? <laughs> yes. You go off for four hours and it looks good in front of the camera. Right. Uh, so <laughs> it's got to be creative. It's got to be disciplined. It's got to be irreverent at times. It's got to surprise them. It can't be predictable. So that takes reflection and thinking. And uh, um, um, so we do a lot of action that is, uh, we think, uh, creates a good reaction. And organizing that you're and, and that's what we talked about at the start. Um, constantly recruiting, constantly training leaders, constantly uh, uh, raising uh, not a lot of money, but enough money. So, you know, we, we think about organizing that three things have to be happening in great organizations. People have to be relating. People have to be learning, and people have to be acting. So in many religious circles, there's, there's some learning going on, and there's a little bit of relating going on, but there's no action, right. external action. And it's killed um, you know, many institutions. In, in a lot of activism, there's a lot of acting, but there's not much relating and there's not much learning, so people make the same mistakes again and again. And reflection, your last point. Well, it's just thinking about things, not reacting, not overreacting. Um, I, I, I was in Wisconsin during the, the Walker situation and the reaction to it. They did, I think, 23 major demonstrations, 50, 70, 100,000 people. After the second or third, I said to people, why are you doing all these? Because as you do these, you can't be building relationships in local communities, and you don't know what your own members are thinking about this situation, which ended up being unfortunately the case. So it's doing all three things and having a rhythm of that, not letting action dominate, but also not letting relating dominate. You've got to get all three going, all three gears. And given the corporate coup d'etat that we have undergone, uh, neoliberalism right. turbocharged under Trump, right. I think you would probably agree that building these grassroots organizations are finally the only mechanism we have left to empower ourselves. Uh, I, I, well, obviously, I think that, and that's what I've spent my life doing. And, and uh, it, it's not going to come out of the Democratic Party, oh, no, which God, is no. an institution. Kind of. <laughs> it's kind of a it's kind of a permanent mobilization, actually. I, I don't oh. consider it an institution. Oh. Uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, it's built around charismatic or non-charismatic wow. figures, a lot of money, and a lot of media. Right. Uh, no relating, uh, and no real action. Right. It's nothing but a reenactment of itself, um, and it's it, it falls flat, obviously. So. Can we rebuild unions? I think we can. It'll take some time, and we're doing it in some parts of the country. Can we rebuild civic life in some of our cities? We have, and we'll do more of that. Um, can we take these people on? I know we can. Uh, uh, but it'll take different tactics. It'll take some very unconventional allies that will, uh, you know, surprise people. But, Great. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Chris. That was community organizer Michael Geegan. There is only one way left to blunt the yearning for fascism coalescing around Donald Trump. It is to build movements or parties that declare war on corporate power, engage in sustained acts of civil disobedience, and seek to reintegrate the disenfranchised back into the economy and political life of the country. The sociologist Emile Durkheim warned, 
that the disenfranchisement of a class of people from the structures of society produced a state of anomie, a condition in which society provides little moral guidance to individuals. Those trapped in this anomie, he wrote, are easy prey to propaganda and emotionally driven mass movements. Organized resistance will never come out of the Democratic Party. The longer the elites who oversee the disemboweling of the country on behalf of corporations remain in charge, the worse it is going to get. Thank you for watching. You can find us on rt.com slash oncontact. See you next week.